I'm hit! I'm hit! I'm hit! Ah! Fuck! We are an empire now, and when we act, we create our own reality. And while you'll study that reality, judiciously as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too. And that's how these things will sort out. We're history's actors, and you, all of you, will be just left to study what we do. Karl Rove We are an empire. We are the largest and most powerful one the world has ever seen. Logic would dictate that we must also have the most powerful propaganda in order to bring about that power. While well, it once started out as the greatest experiment in human freedom with a constitutional republic, it has been subtly and systematically destroyed from within, to the point that we can hardly tell the difference between our nation today and the fascists and the socialists that we fought against in World War II. The Constitution has been gutted from both parties, so much so that it looks like a redacted top-secret document. Even the goodwill, wealth, and sacrifice from the greatest generation has been destroyed by the spoiled generations that have followed, that have never known true sacrifice or even hard times. We have blown through the greatest gift of freedom and the greatest inheritance the world has ever seen. The worst part is we still believe in the illusion of what we once were. Throughout all of history, nations and tyrants alike have used symbols to strike fear or loyalty into their masses. Out of all these symbols that the United States has used, None has been more prominent and as powerful as the American bald eagle. We have been constantly showed the bald eagle, and we have been conditioned to marvel at this majestic bird. This is done not really to marvel at the bird, but to marvel at the American exceptionalism it represents. The average American will get the same feeling looking at a soaring eagle as they would a young soldier going off to war. You would immediately feel cognitive dissidence if I showed you a bald eagle against what it truly represents today in this debt and death paradigm. So the elite must put these images out there for you to sacrifice for their rigged game. Low self-esteem success chance is the conclusion that you want your prospect to have, which says, well, these guys are smart and I'm retarded. Oh, actually, that's not the exact one, but let's say they have that conclusion A. These guys are smart. I'm retarded, I can't do it. But if I could just do one-tenth as much as they do, then this would definitely be worth it, All right? You ever had that rationalization in your mind? Like, well, I'm over here telling you about doing $10 million and whatever a day, you know, 360 grand in nine minutes and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you ever think to yourself, well, Jesus, if I could just do like a little bit of that, I would be stoked. Not to say you guys all have low self-esteem, although every single person in the world does, um, which you should be happy about because you can prey on it like an evil. Never mind. Um, anyway, um, so that's what you want, right? You can prey on it like an evil. You can prey on it like an evil. You can prey on it like an evil. Because of this subtle psychological warfare, marketers know that they can pretty much slap an American eagle or an American flag on anything and it will sell. It is used for selling motorcycles, t-shirts, beers, condoms, and even the best-selling coin in the world, the American Silver Eagle. Simply latch on to this primal urge and you will be a success. Many people would be surprised that the choice of the bald eagle as our nation's symbol was controversial. Ben Franklin argued that the rattlesnake should be the symbol of the temper and conduct of America. The phrase, don't tread on me, that the rattlesnake symbolized showed that we only fought when we're threatened. As far as the bald eagle, Ben Franklin said, For my own part, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen to represent our country. He is a bird of bad moral character. He does not get his living honestly. You may have seen him perched on some dead tree near a river. 
where, too lazy to fish for himself, he watches the labor of the fishing hawk. And when that diligent bird has taken the length of a fish, and is bearing it to his nest to support his mate and young ones, the bald eagle pursues him and takes it from him. Ah! 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 Oh, crap! Crap! Ah! Ah! He goes on to say, With all this injustice, he is never in good case, but like those among men who live by sharping and robbing, he is generally poor and often very lousy. While Ben Franklin saw that this predator bird did not make a good fit for America of our founding fathers, I think it is a perfect symbol for the predator nation that we have become. Smedley Butler was one of the most highly decorated Marines in history. During his 34-year career as a Marine, he participated in military actions in the Philippines, China, Central America, and the Caribbean during the Banana Wars and in France during World War I. By the end of his career, he had received 16 medals Five for heroism. He is one of 19 men to twice receive the Medal of Honor, and one of three to be awarded both the Marine Corps' Brevet Medal and the Medal of Honor, and the only Marine to be awarded the Brevet Medal and two Medals of Honor, all for separate actions. Two years after exposing a fascist coup to take over the United States government headed by Prescott Bush, George H.W. Bush's grandfather, General Butler wrote a book called War is a Racket. In it, he said, I spent 33 years and 4 months in active military service, and during that time period I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, especially the Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902 and 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927 I helped see that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do is operate his racket in three districts. I operated in three continents. What General Butler described is the birth of the debt and death empire. What started out as a grand constitutional republic based on individual freedom, it has been co-opted by the same parasites we once fought against in revolutions and war. The process has been subtle and progressive. Like a cancer, it grows. This warning was echoed by President Eisenhower in his final address to the nation. Until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But we can no longer risk emergency improvisation of national we have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Added to this, three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense 
with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. John F. Kennedy also made a speech prior to his assassination, pleading with the press to expose this evil that sought to infiltrate and destroy America. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no secret is revealed. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. Confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. Even today, John Perkins wrote in Confessions of an Economic Hitman, he said, Economic hitmen are highly paid professionals who cheat countries around the globe out of trillions of dollars. They funnel money from the World Bank, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and other foreign quote-unquote aid organizations into the coffers of huge corporations and the pockets of a few wealthy families who control the planet's natural resources. Their tools include fraudulent financial reports, rigged elections, payoffs, extortion, sex, and murder. They play a game as old as empire, but one that has taken on a new, terrifying dimensions during this time of globalization. So while Ben Franklin felt that the bald eagle was a poor choice to represent the revolutionary American spirit because it was like men who lived by sharping and robbing, I think this predator is a perfect symbol of the debt and death empire we are now today.